Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and switch us over to our panel. Um, one of our panelists has not yet logged in, uh, but potentially she'll still join us. Her name is Stasha, and she is an adult who uses augmentative communication. Um, and then we also have a couple of other individuals joining us today for our panel, which we're really excited about. Um, we have Jones and Trina, and I've worked with Jones for several years on his communication strategies. Um, he and his mom have joined us for events like this in the past, and they are wonderful resources when we think about, um, you know, Mike's comment about having uh, role models and supports in the community. I think they have both filled that role for other individuals in the past, as well as for us when we do events like these. So thank you guys for joining us. And then we also have Shannon, who is a parent of a boy who is using augmentative communication. Um, and she has definitely been really a wonderful uh, person in terms of helping us learn more about the things that are helpful for families who are just getting started with AAC and ways that we can be supportive. We also have one of our therapists who's going to join the panel, Sarah Marshall. Um, she is, as Jen said at the very beginning, she's one of our more senior therapists in our programs. She helped develop both the partnership program and the ECHO program. Um, so she's really a groundbreaker in terms of helping move services forward in the state of Wisconsin for individuals using AAC. Um, so we have some prepared questions that we uh, will have the panelists talk about first, but if we have time, we're also happy to try to have some questions from the chat be answered. So for example, Jen, I know you asked a question about um, kind of the lived experience of people using AAC and kind of how they get started. And our first question actually relates similarly to that. So I'm gonna go ahead and have that be our first question. Um, and I, I think we could start maybe with um, Trina and Jones for this question, and then we'll come to you next, Shannon. So the question is, what's one thing about you or your family members' experience with communication strategies that you'd like to share with other people? Hi, everyone. Well, thanks for having us um, on as panelists, Abby, and good to see you, Sarah, and, um, and all the other people we know and, and people we're meeting. Um, so, one strategy that we um, that we have employed, I think, is um, trying to be preemptive about having um, having buttons in a um, pre-programmed that we know. Um, like we went to a wedding, and so we made sure that we moved some of those people um, up forward on like the the front easy access part and things that we, activities that we knew that we were going to be doing, made sure that those buttons were easy for Jones to access so he could communicate quickly. Um, because sometimes we know with him that um, when we're in a public place and maybe with new communication partners or new communication environments, like in an airport or at a wedding, um, maybe he's not used to that. So we just wanna make it as easy as possible for him to access and that maybe I can get that page ready for him. Um, so that's something that we've been um, using with, with pretty good success lately. I hope that answered the question. <laughs> that's a great tip. I think it's really important for all, for all of us to, to kind of think ahead and be prepared when we're gonna be communicating about things, but especially for individuals using AAC where those words might be buried further in their device or might be, you know, it might take longer to compose some of those messages that you know you're gonna to wanna to say over and over. It's helpful to plan ahead and get all that ready. Shannon, do you have tips or uh, an experience or strategy you'd like to share with people? Um, yeah, I do. I, I think for us, because Eli is going to be turning six soon, he was so young when he started using AAC for us. One of like the tips or strategies that I have is I have to like train my brain <laughs> first uh, to be kind of, and I always have to have that mindset and I have to kind of like realign myself in that AAC mood. Like, for example, um, he has some mobility issues, so we have a lot of falls. Um, and I have to preface this by saying that, you know, there's no like broken bones sticking out. It's not like an emergency situation or anything, but like maybe when he does have a fall, my initial instinct as a mom is like to run over and be like, are you okay? Give him a huge hug and, you know, 
ask what's what's wrong or find the boo boo. But I have to like stop myself and make sure that I have either his device with me or we also have like a, a low tech pain scale that we've been working on lately. I have to like stop myself, go and grab it. And I can still hug him and everything, but I have to um, keep creating those opportunities, which for me has been challenging, but now I feel like I'm in a, a good rhythm. And so I've tried to apply that to um, multiple situations, whether it's at school, at home, at the doctor, whenever. I call it like my AAC mindset. <laughs> I love that. That's such a great um, way to think about how do how do we make it a part of our everyday and how do we make it become really routine and useful um, and really promoting that self-advocacy and self-determination that we also had in the chat earlier. I love that. Uh, Sarah, do you have anything you'd want to add about? Um, I know that you uh, work with tons of individuals who use AAC. So do you have any strategies or tips that you feel like, especially for new individuals who are newly being introduced to AAC? You may hear you may hear my little guy in the background, but um, I thought what Trina and Shannon shared was fantastic. Um, and there's nobody better to learn from than parents. Um, but my biggest tip when getting started is really, as Trina and Shannon shared, it's a family affair, and it's not just the child or the adult you the AAC. We want everybody to be using it: um, siblings, cousins. Um, peers, parents, grandparents, everybody's taking a turn using those pictures and putting them all over um, your environment too. I love that. I think that immersion piece is really important as well. You guys, that's great. So I'm going to go ahead and move us on to our next question that we have. Um, and this time, maybe I'll come first to uh, Shannon, and then we'll go up to Trina and Jones. So how do you or your family member explain and describe their communication to other people? I, I think we describe it just kind of as um, we prefer to use the talker. And I think that he is great at using the talker. We also have some low tech options. Um, Eli is really good at pointing. So I always encourage people who um, maybe are meeting him for the first time or like extended family to make sure that, because we're so used just in verbal conversation to just only listen to words, to make sure that they're paying attention to his eyes and his gestures and not only the talker. <laughs> but I also, um, one of the other things that I like to really uh, just reiterate is the talker is like very similar to his mouth. So as far as like cousins and stuff, not to be touching the talker constantly, but it's okay to engage with it, especially if he invites it, right? So kind of like a mixed bag, maybe <laughs> be a better. I hope that answered the question. <laughs> yeah, that multimodal communication is so important because none of us only communicate through speech, right? We all use facial expressions and gestures and other strategies too. And so for our individuals who might be using an augmentative communication device, those things don't go away. And I think we all have to be very alert and perceptive. And the more we know somebody, the more we can understand their communication effectively, right? Jones and Trina, what do you guys think? Yeah, we have kind of a similar answer um, to Shannon. And I really appreciated that, um, that Jennifer shared in the beginning of the presentation that, um, that AAC is not just using um, not just using your device, but also is um, nonverbal gestures. And um, you know, I think we we often go back to one time I was frustrated that Jones wasn't using his new um, new communication device, and I kind of like threw up my hands and said, you know, I, I guess I don't get to choose how you communicate. And and um, my husband was like, I think you need to you know, hear what you just said, because we need to respect and honor how they choose to communicate and, um, and support and support the users in that. So whether that's, I don't feel like using my device right now, I just want to point at things or answer yes and no questions, then, then we, we want to respect that and have that and not, and not have, um, our preferred method for them to communicate be forced on them. So that's something that we talk about a lot. Um, although we also try to tell Jones that 
um, that when you're with a communication partner, they may not know what those gestures are associated, the meaning that is associated with it. So that we're constantly trying to help him um, learn how to effectively communicate with others who may not know. So that's um, why we try to model maybe on the um, communication device, like, oh, if you're going to look at that, here's where you can say that so that we're respecting and, and allowing the communication that he's choosing, but then also saying, if someone, if you want to tell that to someone else other than us, this is how you would do that. Um, so that's, so that's something that we, because he does like to use a lot of gestures and often doesn't want to use his communication device. So that's such great information, Trina. I think when we think about individuals who are using AAC, um, that kind of what we, we call that code switching, and they talk about code switching when somebody's bilingual in two different languages, and we can almost think about AAC sometimes as being another language, too, that this individual is using. And so, you know, for Jones and for others, making sure that we're honoring their choice about how they want to communicate, but also teaching them about what those decisions mean in terms of their partner's ability to understand if they don't know kind of that language or that, that modality. That's such a good point. I love it. I just want to add to that really yes, quickly. Please do. <laughs> kind of going back to that like AAC mindset that I said earlier, like my husband and I are experts in Eli as far as what he wants, like what he's he uses like uh, glancing a lot. So if it was just, you know, my husband and I communicating with him, we would have typically no problem. <laughs> but you know, we also have to straddle that line into like, like you said, also teaching them that when you're at school or at the doctor or when it's something, you know, like trying to explain where it does hurt or something, typically we need something like the AAC device or a talker to do it. So it's always a line <laughs> that we straddle. Oh, for sure, for sure. And I think that's, I, th I wanna point out too that we, we call this an expert panel even with the variety of different individuals we have on it because we know that you guys are the experts in your family members and your daily life and what that looks like and what your hopes and dreams are for that individual and what their hopes and dreams are for themselves. And so the only way that we can really implement communication in ways that are functional and appropriate and you know meet those communication needs is when we consider your guys' expertise and Jones, your expertise about yourself um, and all of those pieces. I think that's excellent. Okay. So our next question is relates to um, schools. And so we wanna know a little bit more about your experience with the education and school system and supporting you or your family members communication within that system. And so Trina, I know you guys have been in, Jones has been in school a little bit longer than Shannon's son. So maybe we can have you start from your experience over the years and then Shannon, we can have you start from um, kind of as you're, you're coming into the school system. And then Sarah has a lot of great expertise about collaborations with schools too. Yep. And, um, Jones wanted me to share what his plans are for this afternoon. So I, um, and, and I have learned that if I, uh, if I do not share what he wants to communicate, he will, um, he will be very persistent until I do. So I'm just sharing, <laughs> sharing that with you. Um, yeah. So for school, I mean, we've had, um, we've had Abby, we've been fortunate enough to have Abby down the street here in Madison so that she can um, help with school now a little bit more, but we've had some, um, we have, one thing that we have learned that I thought was so interesting, that's a story I share sometimes, is that we've had several um, speech and language pathologists over the years, now that Jones is in seventh grade, so since, you know, third um, three years old up until 13. So we've had, you know, 10 years of that um, and multiple speech and language pathologists. And they've all had different focus. And one that we had was an AAC. She was a guru and she loved getting data. And Jones was not excited about being a data participant. So um, I was really excited because we'd gotten, you know, love to use, have him use his AAC at school, and we were really excited for that. Um, but he did not, um, he, he wasn't really a participant in that, and often would only just 
look at the clock and then look at the speech like like let's get out of here so she was not able to collect the data that she wanted to and then the next slp she really didn't have a lot of experience with aac and although i was upset about that we found that um as we kind of reframed it as jones was the expert on the device and he was going to teach the slp um about it that empowerment led to a very productive um, relationship and a very productive speech and language pathology um, experience for him and for the clinician who then was able to learn a lot more about AAC. Um, yeah, he totally would. And, and um, we thought that was a really nice reframe because the other one was like the SLP was expert and then switching that really helped him feel like uh, ownership of it. And, um, and so that also helped me as a parent to say, you know, I don't get to decide what kind of relationship he develops with the clinicians and therapists that he works with, especially in school when I'm not there. And so, um, you know, giving him that voice, uh, I, I think we've kind of, I've been able to back off and say, you know what, he's going to have to develop that himself. And, um, and and having him show all the, the SLPs that have come along, like, okay, you show them how you use it. And um, and so that's how we've uh, approached it late, um, lately. And that's been, it's been great. So, um, uh, and also like, yeah, I'm gonna, I'll end there, thanks. I think that that ownership and self-advocacy is such an important skill too to, to make sure that we're empowering Jones and others to, to tell other people about how they want to communicate and how they do communicate. Before I come to you, Shannon, Mike, I'm wondering if you would prep a message for us while Shannon is sharing, if you have any information or thoughts about like your own experience when you were transitioning from high school out into the world? Because um, I think that's an, a piece, when we think about the educational system, obviously we think about what's happening while kids are in the educational system, but then we also need to think about what happens from when they're 14 to 21 and we're looking at what's gonna happen afterwards. So Mike, I'm wondering if you would be willing to share anything about your experience with transition um, and you can kind of get a message ready and let us know if that's if you're willing to share. I know we didn't, you're not officially on the panel, but since you're here, we'd love to use your expertise. Shannon, go ahead and tell us a bit about your guys' experience with the school system. Yeah, so Eli just started kindergarten, <laughs> which was obviously, uh, so we haven't been in the school system that long, but um, it's definitely a learning curve uh, for us. And so far, it's been really great. The SLP that he has at school is not very familiar with his talker or the system. She has used it uh, a similar talker, um, but she's been really honest with that and upfront about it. And, you know, one of the things that we kind of said from like, we kind of met her uh, before he started school, obviously. And you know, it's, it's okay if you, I mean, not every SLP is going to have experience with every single program and every single method out there, but um, kind of like what, what Trina said, if they have a really good rapport and a good relationship, I think that's going to extend over whatever technical aspects. And again, I'm a newbie, so I could be wrong, but <laughs> I think as far as like our experience so far, that's what it's been. And just in another quick point, we are part of the, um, the CDP program, uh, the communication development. And um, so Sarah Marshall, we work with her very closely and she is in the process right now, we're setting up a meeting with between Sarah and special ed teacher, kindergarten teacher, the SLP. One of the really big sticking points that I wanted for that is um, Eli has a really good relationship with his one-on-one -on -one aide. And, you know, that's the person who is with him in the classroom one-on-one -on -one, and they weren't going to invite him to the meeting. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> I'm like, he has to be there because, I mean, I think he's the one who is going to be helping to model, helping to, um, you know, basically communicate with Eli the entire time that he's there. So um, another thing that I've had in my small experience is just to make sure that all the main, like all the, the important people 
are in the room and not just, you know, the SLP and, and the teacher too. Yes, that's great advice, Shannon, because I think that's not always a given, although it might feel obvious, like the people that are with him the most during the day are the ones who need to be involved in these meetings and learning about the communication device and how to support it in the in the daily functions. But those are also the people who are often the most busy and the hardest to find a time when we can pull them into those kinds of meetings. So I think that advocacy you're doing is really important um, and that you know everybody should know that that's something you can ask for from your school team and hopefully get that support. Um, Sarah, do you have anything to share about collaboration before we hopefully come to Mike? Mike, I hope I'm not putting you on the spot. <laughs> Yeah, I do. Um, oh, no. <laughs> We're just going to have Jack. I don't, I was going to say, I don't think anybody would mind if he yeah. was joining. Um, <laughs> so I think um, something I'd like to just keep in mind is you know, today is called AAC Day with the Experts, and you've heard very little actually from speech language pathologists. Um, you've heard from people who use AAC, parents, um, and some speech therapists, but that's because it's it, communication is a collaboration. It's a team thing. You can't communicate if no one else is there. And so when we think about communication, it involves everybody. And so kind of like what um, Jones and Trina were talking about and what Shannon was talking about, it doesn't necessarily matter how much experience somebody has. It's their willingness to, to learn and to communicate with you and to collaborate. Um, and so the important thing is really expanding beyond your speech language pathologist, involving your, your aide or your paraprofessional, um, the OTs in the, the district, the teachers, the special education teacher, and really just focusing on making it that team approach. Um, and keeping in mind that even if your school speech language pathologist, for example, doesn't have experience with your particular AAC system, they are an expert in language um, and teaching children how to, um, how to learn language, both receptively and expressively. And as we talked about before, AAC is just another modality for expressive language. And so regardless of if your school speech therapist has used a particular system, they're still an expert in their area of, of the team. Um, and so I think um, as long as people are willing to keep that open mind and maintain great communication and collaboration, um, you're going to be in great shape no matter um, the experience specific to technology or not. Yeah, that's great advice, Sarah. I think that that's so important for us to always be keeping in mind that that AAC isn't something separate. When when we think about AAC as, a, as an area that speech language pathologists know about, the most important thing to know about is language and communication and AAC is the tool you're using to get there. Um, but it's still that's those same things that we know about the importance of communication and language development. Um, there's a really great message in the chat that relates to some of the adult pieces too. Judy says that my adult son who has Down syndrome with associated dyspraxia and dysarthria is just learning to use an AAC device. He communicates for himself, he, I'm sorry, he advocates for himself communicatively by telling others to write it down so that he can share his life experiences with others. I think that's so important to, you know, I think Trina captures it really well. Love that he's finding his voice and using it in the way that he finds the most helpful or the best for him. I think that's so important to know that everybody's individual and everybody has their own, you know, preferences and needs for communication. Mike, I'm going to ask you to unmute quick and just see, can you just give me a yeah or no if you do want to share anything about your experience in the education system or about that transition piece? Yeah. Okay, great. I will also send you a, a request to turn your video on then if that's okay. And then feel free to go ahead and share when you're ready. I went through schools with awesome, awesome teams and bad teams, period. I feel that we need to remember as we have life after school, we always need to think, what will they be doing after they leave school? Yeah. 
that, Mike, I think that message is so important. Like we, we're not only who we are at one given moment in our life, right? We're always looking ahead to what's going to come next. And so for, for individuals who are in schools, thinking about what is going to happen after school and how are we preparing them for that? How are we giving them learning opportunities and self-determination to pick what they want that to look like and as much opportunity to learn and prepare as we can? I know that families might not like to start thinking about it when They are in kindergarten and But it is would H help why oh you I know that families might not like to start up thinking about it when they are in kindergarten but it would help you yeah, that's such a great point, Mike, like the earlier, the better. And there's actually a comment in the chat that relates to that, which I'm wondering if we, if I can mute you and have you answer the question while we move on to the next question. And then when you have your message ready, I'll come back to you. This, this question, or I guess, yeah, it is a question. Um, they're saying that I don't know your age or how old you were when you went through the public school, but I'm wondering if your school programming included a personalized transition plan and if that plan included AAC because this person is pointing out that now there are, um, there's a formal part of the IEP service delivery process where you start at 14 and you start planning for transition. And that starts, like we said, at the age of 14. So Mike, can you tell, can you get a message ready about your experiences when you were in school, if there was like a formal transition plan and if it included information about your AAC device? And then I'll come back to you after this next question for others. Um, and so I'm wondering if you guys can tell us uh, about what are some of the challenges that you experience with using AAC? And so that could be in, you know, in both in school, but also just in kind of your typical daily communication or daily interactions. Um, and I don't know who I went to first last time. So maybe Shannon, can I come to you first on this one? Sure. Um, so Eli primarily uses his talker uh, for communication. And I feel like just like any other, you know, electronic device, cell phone, laptop, it sometimes it feels like the time that we most need it is the time where the volume doesn't work or the screen is frozen 
or um, I'm also really bad at doing updates, like software updates on it. <laughs> so I think like everyday things, those are some of the challenges that we face. Nothing that has completely broken down like our system. Um, but in those instances too, we've been working on uh, a lower tech option too, since he kind of started with the uh, talker and enjoys interacting with that more. Um, so that's been one of the things that we've tried to have like a workaround for some of the challenges that we've had. Uh, one other quick thing that I wanted to mention, just because of Eli's age, and I'm sure Trina has way more experience with, with this too, but um, Eli uh, is in the hospital a lot and he is a medically complex. And so in some of our interactions with like not only medical professionals, but at school and everything, um, as the adult and, and as the mom in the situation, I'm really having to, uh, again, remind myself and remind everyone around me that they can actually talk directly to him. So if a, you know, a doctor's rounding after hospitalization and says, you know, what is today, is he doing better than he was yesterday? I'm like, look at, do you feel better than what you were feeling yesterday? <laughs> and um, most of the time that's all it takes. And then they, you know, follow that lead. And do you have any more questions? They ask him first instead of me. Again, I know he's only six years old or almost six. So I have to answer <laughs> some of the harder questions, but um, making sure that uh, he has that agency and he's able to be a part of the conversation, especially when it's about him. I love that. Yeah, I think that it's so wonderful that even at a young age, you're modeling that for other people too. And for, for him, you're modeling for Eli that, you know, he has the right and we want to hear what he has to say about not only those really important things like how he's feeling and his medical needs, but everything. We want him to always feel like his voice is important for us to hear. So that's great that you model that for him and for other people to learn. Jones, do you want to tell us anything about your communication? Or do you want mom to? I see you shaking your head. If you want to say anything, you know you're always welcome to speak up, but we'll let mom talk a little bit too. Yeah. Yeah. Trina, your audio is cutting out a tiny bit for me. There we go. How's that? Is that better? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, good. Thank you. Jones is a um, hacker, so he's probably messing with your laptop. Yeah, he wants it to be on me. He doesn't want it. He wants to listen out, out of the camera view, I guess. Um, yes, yeah, so as far as, the, and this question was about challenges. Yeah, so we've had a few challenges with um, positioning with Jones's wheelchair. Um, you know, I know some users have, have, a, have are able to wear their devices. Um, Jones is not able to do that. So um, we've had some, but we have a, a great system now. So um, we've been we've been fortunate that he he's able to have his device with him a little bit more as he's transferring, um, being transported. And then at school, it's a little bit easier. It was kind of big and uh, it was, he has a long focal distance for his eye gaze. So he has an eye gaze system. Um, so we've had some positioning challenges that we just have had to try to make the best of um, and then understand that we have a low tech option that we always can carry with us that doesn't break or doesn't, well, it does break, but it's, <laughs> um, it doesn't have, you know, is technical um, issues with it. So we, um, we try to keep that updated and, um, and just have some other options for him to communicate. Um, so yeah, outdoors, I think we're doing better with that, but that's been most of our challenge is, um, it's just positioning and appropriateness of use um, in the community. So those have been our, our biggest challenges. Yeah, and I think you illustrate a really important point too, Trina, about that problem solving, that ongoing, you know, I think for any of us, we don't always find a solution that just fixes something that's maybe challenging for us in a moment. And so we always have to be flexible and thinking about it and, you know, kind of what can we try next? So I think you guys always are really good too about saying, well, if we can't find a solution now, what's the next thing we try um, to always be making 
communication available and then having those backups like low tech strategies and the ways Jones communicates even without anything outside of his body so that we know he can always express himself even in moments when maybe the technology isn't working. Sarah, do you have anything to add about challenging aspects of working using AAC? Yeah, I have um, just some common things that come up um, in sessions from teams is um, using the communication device um, as a way to access the educational curriculum, which of course that's the child's voice or the individual's voice and they need to use that to participate in school. But just wanting to be careful about not using the device to test on the educational curriculum either, um, making sure, you know, this is the individual's voice and um, that's their, their mode of expression. And so maybe they don't want to answer the test questions right now. They want to talk about something else. Um, and that doesn't mean that they don't know the answer to the question. And so making sure that we're not um, making decisions or um, impressions about the child's abilities based on their willingness to use their communication device at a particular time to answer a particular question. Um, and so just keeping in mind that it's that individual's voice and all kids um, and adults like to talk about what they want to talk about um, when they want to talk about it. And, and we want to make sure that um, we're empowering that and also shaping that to be appropriate, um, but being careful to not make um, judgments about somebody's abilities based on that either. Um, there's a lot that goes into um, using a communication device. It's a lot harder than just answering the question verbally. And so it's hard to tease apart why somebody might not have answered that question and what the barrier is. And so really just being open-minded and investigating that before making decisions or assumptions. That's great advice, Sarah. Thank you so much. Um, Mike, I see you're still getting your message ready. Can I um, have us do, we're getting close to time. And so I have one last question that I always love to wrap up with because although Shannon and Jones and Trina are individuals and family members who use AAC, they're also people. And so just to hear more about how you guys live your life, I think is really fun and exciting so that everybody kind of gets to know you. So Mike, while you finish yes your no. message. My team did things like getting information about assistive technology and outside companies, but I think it would be better if they would let me know about different organizations to help me. Okay, so I heard you say yes and no about that formal transition plan. So there were things in place to work on making sure your technology was transitioning and supporting you, but it doesn't sound like there was a formal plan to do that. And it sounds like having more resources for what groups were out there to help with that would have been helpful when you were going through school. Is that accurate, Mike? Yeah. Okay, great. Well, and I think, Mike, that ties back well to you as a resource in the state um, and, you know, the things that the AAC network does. So if others on this on this uh, call are, are wondering about how to plan for transition and how to make sure those resources are there and what agencies are available to help. I think Mike can be a great resource and the AAC network can be a great resource for that. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and move us to our last question for today. And that is, um, what are the kinds of activities that bring you and your family joy and satisfaction? Um, and I, I, whoever, want, whoever mutes first can go first. <laughs> Okay, I guess it's me. <laughs> um, we love to go camping. We, uh, Eli loves to be in the RV. We go RV camping all the time. And so one really cool way that we've been able to use the um, AAC device out there is that we have an entire page worth of like forest animals. And we'll be like going through the forest <laughs> or hiking and we'll be like pointing out the animals. And then we got to try to find like what the animal says and we've encountered people on trails before and they have just been like awestruck and that's a really really good uh time for Eli to then transition to like my name's Eli this is my talk here this is how I speak and he is um great at, at doing all of that so we just enjoy being outside and seeing all of the different <laughs> animals going for walks and stuff um another really cool thing that he loves to do is tell jokes he is a great icebreaker that way. And so, 
you know, he'll tell jokes to nurses to make them laugh. He, um, that's like one of the ways that he kind of warmed up to his kindergarten teacher. And then um, is quickly followed up depending on how happy he is to see the person or meet them by asking them their phone number. And I haven't taken that off of his talker yet because he enjoys it so much. He um, He's laughing while they're laughing and making that connection, which, yeah, he loves jokes. <laughs> That's fantastic. Jones, you have something you love to ask everybody too. I'm wondering if you're going to be willing to share it with us or if you're going to have mom. Oh, mm, yep, looks like no. Looks like you're going to have mom tell. But I wonder, <laughs> Trina, obviously you should say what you were already planning, but I think you should also tell yeah. about asking the doctors. Yeah. About yes. Yes, um, Shannon, we had we had to take that off uh, Jones's button too because he he would always ask like like the young college girls, can I have your phone number? <laughs> you know, that was something that was always. <laughs> um, but when yeah, well, he has on a he <laughs> he's laughing. Um, he has on his personal page. Um, what kind of car do you drive? And he loves to ask everyone that. And um, especially like doctors and nurses and um, some of the doctors are like, you know, that's kind of a different question. They don't get asked every day, <laughs> um, but the nurses are usually, um, usually are pretty game or therapists like to answer that question too. So he's, he's definitely big into transportation. Um, he loves public transportation. We, um, so we have to go on the Metro bus all the time or driving car. We are always driving. He loves to just move be moving that way and so um but that's a that's um that's a universal um thing so everyone has a transportation story or that they like so so we often find that that's a great way to communicate with people that um so so that's kind of one thing that Jones always likes to to talk to people about that um that's fun so um, either they they they're aware of the public transportation system and then can really engage with him and he'll he likes to guess um, for to have people tell him where they live and where they work and then he'll tell them how what bus route he can go they can go on and but if they don't know about public transportation he likes to um, be an expert and share um, how they can um, add that to their life. <laughs> So that's um, that's something that is a big part of our lives too now. That's amazing. Jones, can I share about your question for the doctors when you have been at the hospital before? Can I share about that? Was that a yes? Yes, he said you can. <laughs> I loved this story when you guys told me this. So um, Jones was at the hospital and he he needed his mom to program in a button where he could ask, what kind of car do you drive? Um, because, because he's so interested in technology, he of course wanted to know what all the fancy doctor's cars were. But Jones, I remember you telling me that you were really unimpressed. Everybody drove like a Subaru and, and <laughs> like an Acura and there were no Porsches and there were no... Mercedes Benz is. is that right, Jones? <laughs> yeah, the, the, their neurosurgeon, he was like, what kind of car do you drive? I think he was expecting it to be super, you know, super fancy. And he was like, um, a Toyota Corolla. And Jones was like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Why? <laughs> oh my gosh, I love it so much. Well, thank you guys again. We are almost to time. Um, and I see there's a really wonderful um, message from Elise in the chat, which I'm not going to read all out loud, but please take a look before you head out. Um, Elise, thank you for sharing your guys' experiences as well. Uh, I want to thank everybody for being here today, our attendees for joining us um, on a Saturday morning, our panelists for sharing your important experiences and information, and for Mike for pinch hitting and joining on the panel, even though we hadn't necessarily uh, prepared you for that. Mike, your presentation and resources were al also so wonderful. Um, as Teresa and Clark said, if you go back to the website where you registered 
uh, the Weissman Center website, you'll be able to find the recording from today's uh, presentations. And then you'll also be able to find resources that were shared there so that if you need to get in touch with the AAC network or the if you wanna look up the literacy resources from our other presenters, you will be able to grab that. Thanks everybody again and have a great rest of your weekend.